Hello everyone. So today we're going to be discussing two properties of definite integrals, which are the King's rule and the change of limits. You can also call it splitting the limits. So we're going to have a integral, a definite integral, and we're going to solve it in two approaches. The first one is going to use this thing called the King's rule. I'll explain what that is. And secondly, we're going to solve the same question in another way using the change of limits or splitting the limits. So yeah, let's just get started. This is the problem A3 from the Putnam exam in 1980. And in this video, we're going to be looking at properties of definite integrals, the King rule of definite integration, which is really just a colloquial name. I don't really know why it's called the King's rule. Maybe because it's used a lot. That could be a reason, but you can call it whatever you want. And then we have another property of definite integrals, which is called the change of limits for splitting the limits in a way. So we are going to be solving the problems in two ways, like I said before. And after that, we have book sessions of college mathematics and at the end, a similar but challenging problem. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical olympiads, physics olympiads, computer science and informatics olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. Okay, so what do we have? So we, ha we have to just evaluate this integral. And you have this root 2 over here, you have this tangent function as well. And you can clearly see that it's a definite integral. So let's maybe just start with discussing what this King's property is, you know, this King's property of definite integrals. So really, it's just a fancy name for something quite simple, but quite useful. So if let's say we have an integral from a to b of f of x dx, this is actually equivalent to the integral from a to b of f of a plus b minus x dx. So you basically add the lower limit and upper limit and subtract x. It still works. It's the same. It's the same value of the definite integral. And Maybe I think it's a good idea to just discuss the proof of this as well. It's pretty simple, actually. Let's maybe start with the right hand side and then we'll uh, prove that it's equal to the left hand side, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a plus b minus x to be equal to t. So I can see that dt is negative dx because a and b really are constants. Now, when x tends to a, that's the lower limit, t would tend to b. Similarly, when x would tend to b, which is the upper limit, t would tend to a. So how would I write this integral? I would essentially write this as um, integral of f of t. And then you have this dx, but dx is nothing but negative dt. And then you have the lower limit that is from b and upper limit is a. And I can also write this as I can just change the limits, interchange the limits. And when you interchange the limits, the integral gets multiplied by minus one. So I can write this as the integral from a to b of f of t dt. And now because it's a definite integral, you can also write this as integral from a to b of f of x dx. And I think so essentially the idea is that the definite integral do not depend on the variable, you know, because the integral of x dx, let's say from 0 to 1 will be the same as the integral of u du from 0 to 1. Because essentially this is just a value. Definite integral is nothing but it's just a value. Right, just a value. It's just you're computing this. This will be x squared by 2 from 0 to 1. And similarly, this will be u squared by 2 from 0 to 1, which is obviously 1 by 2 in both cases. But apart from that, you see that you get the integral of f of x dx from a to b, which is indeed the left hand side of our King's property. So that means that this does indeed hold true. Well, okay. So maybe how can we use this King's property to solve our win question, right? So we have the integral i, I'm just going to call it i, from 0 to pi over 2 of bx divided by 1 plus tangent of x raised to the power root 2. So I'm going to say that f of x, what is it? Let's say it is 1 by 1 plus tan x raised to the power root 2, right? Pretty clear. So f of a plus b minus x. Here a is pi by 2, b is 0. That would be nothing but 1 over 1 plus tangent of pi by 2 minus x whole raised to the power root 2. So effectively, f of a plus b minus x is 1 over 1 plus 
cotangent x raised to root 2 because tangent of 90 minus theta is cotangent theta. So, okay, great. Let me just maybe label this as something. Let me just call this as equation number 1. And i is equivalently also 0 to power by 2, 1 over 1 plus cotangent x raised to power root 2 dx from King's property or King's rule, whatever. So, i then becomes integral from 0 to power 2 of 1 over 1 plus 1 over tangent of x whole raised to the power root 2 dx because cotangent is nothing but 1 over tangent okay great so which implies that i is nothing but the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of tangent x raised to power root 2 over 1 plus tangent x raised to the power root 2 and obviously dx and let me just call that as equation number 2 and you see the denominator of equation number two and equation number one is the same. So we can just add them up. Why not, right? So you just add these two integrals, you'll get two i, you'd get the integral from zero to pi over two. And the first integral numerator was just one. Second integral was tan x raised to the root two. And obviously you have dx, not to forget that. And the denominator was the same, which is 1 plus tan x, this per root 2. So these things get cancelled. You see, this and this actually get cancelled. So all that we are left with is 2i is the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of dx, which is obviously nothing but x. And the limits go from 0 to pi over 2. So 2i then becomes pi over 2. Therefore, i becomes pi over 4. And I think that's great because... What this King's property really did is that it really simplified the integral after which we just had to add the things and we got our result. Things actually just cancelled out. But this is not the most important thing. You got the answer, great. But what's the most important thing, right? There's an important result associated with this. If you notice something, right? If you notice something, this root 2 that we had in the question, there was no role of that. It didn't matter if it was root 2, if it was n, if it was uh, pi, if it was some Euler's number, whatever it was, it just didn't matter. Anywhere over here, it did not matter ro what root 2 was. If it was, it had been root 3, the answer would have been the same. If it was root 5, root 7, root 9, root 11, root anything, any number, 3, 4, 5, 6, minus 1, minus 2, whatever it was, it would have been the same because essentially everything would cancel out. Right? So effectively, Effectively, the important result is that even if we would have 1 plus tangent x to the power n from 0 to pi over 2, the result would have been the same, pi over 4. And again, you can prove this just by replacing tan x with tan of pi by 2 minus x. And you'll get the same result. Things would just cancel out. So this is a very, very important result, right? The integral from 0 to pi over 2 of dx divided by 1 plus this is pi over 4. It's a very important result, right? And similarly, if you want to maybe convert this into sine and cosine, you can write it something like this, right? 1 over sine this power nx and cosine this power nx. So this eventually becomes integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine this power n times x divided by cosine this power nx plus sine this power nx which is pi by 4. So these are very two important results. It works for any n. It just works for any n. Because eventually all you really have to do is apply King's property and everything just cancels out into something very simple. And dx obviously. How can you forget that? So these are two very important properties that I think everyone should keep in mind because they might be used. And if you just remember this result, it might help you somewhere down the line. Okay? Great. So that was approach number one. What we discussed using King's property. That was approach number one. Now let's maybe discuss this approach number two or method number two, right? Method two. Okay, great. So method two is going to rely on another property, which I was referring to as the change of limits or the splitting of limits. So let me just discuss the property first and then we'll jump onto the problem. So this property says that let's say you have an integral from a to b of f of x dx. You can essentially split this integral into two parts. Okay. And you can split it in such a way that you can introduce a new limit c. And then this c goes over here and then you have the b over here. 
So integration is areas. So you can think of it as summation of areas, and that is why the splitting of this integral works. Now, to keep in mind that whenever you're introducing this new this new limit c, the lower limit of the second integral has to be the same, right? And the upper limit of the second integral has to be the upper limit of the original integral. So those are just the things to keep in mind. But essentially, I think this is not very hard to remember. Right, so we can call this as splitting of limits or change of limits or anything. But again, how can we apply this to our problem? So in our problem, we had the integral i is equal to integral from 0 to pi over 2 of dx over 1 plus tangent x is power root 2, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to split this integral from 0 to pi over 4 of this thing. And next, I'm going to go from pi over 4 to pi over 2. So again, over here, the role of the C, the role of the C is pi over 4, right? And everything else, A and B are 0 and pi over 2 respectively. So I'm just kind of like splitting the limits over here, right? And everything else obviously remains the same. Okay, great. So how does this help? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this thing as I1 and this thing I2. So I is I1 plus I2. And maybe I can just analyze I2 separately over here. So I2 is integral from pi over 4 to pi over 2 of dx over 1 plus tangent x is power root 2. And I'm going to use a substitution over here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in x with pi by 2 minus y. So a little bit of change of variables over here. dx becomes negative dy, obviously. So when x tends to pi by 4, y would tend to pi by 2. And when x would tend to pi by 2, y would tend to 0. So that's the change of the limits effectively. So this i2 then becomes integral from um, pi over 4 to 0. And then we have this dy is negative dx. So we have this negative sign over here. And then you obviously replace it. 1 plus tangent of pi by 2 minus y and that thing raised to power root 2. Yeah, just figure this out. And this actually simplifies into something quite good because then i2 then just becomes integral from 0 to pi over 4. Like I said, I switched up the limits. Multiplied by minus 1. This becomes dy. This becomes 1 plus cotangent y raised to power root 2. But like I said before, the variable y does not matter. I can write it in terms of x as well. Right? dx over 1 plus cotangent x is per root 2 and that's great because i2 then just becomes integral from 0 to power 4 of if i just if i just like write cotangent as 1 over tangent i'll get tangent x is per root 2 dx divided by 1 plus tangent x raised to the power root 2 and if you remember i1 well i1 was integral from 0 to pi over 4 of 1 over 1 plus tangent x raised to the power root 2 dx and i was nothing but i1 plus i2, right? So if you actually see, once you add both of these quantities, again, the denominators are the same. And when you add the numerators, you get something very interesting, right? You'll actually get the same. Tan x is per root 2, and the denominator is exactly the same. And that helps because it just cancels out, yeah? So i becomes the integral from 0 to pi of 4 of dx, which is simply x from 0 to pi over 4. So i just becomes pi over 4, which is what we had noted from our uh, from the method number 1 as well. So yeah, those were two ways to solve this problem. And again, two very important, uh, very important properties of definite integrals that are used a lot. And most importantly, the result that we talked about above, the thing working for any general n instead of root 2, root 3 or whatever. So yeah, I really hope you learned something from that and keep that result in mind for future questions. Okay, so we have certain book sessions so called Mathematics, Introduction to Real Analysis, Principles of Mathematical Analysis by Rudin, Calculus Volume 1 and Volume 2 by Apostle, Topology, Contemporary Abstract Algebra by Galen, Topics in Algebra by Hurstein, Lin a Linear Algebra done right by Axler, and of course, Abstract Algebra by Dermot and Foot. Okay, so at the end we have a simple but challenging problem and I wanted to evaluate this integral. And again, really, you just need to use the King's rule over here. So maybe try it out and if you're able to make any progress on it or if you're able to solve it, 
let me know in the comment section and until then i'll see you in the next video thank you very much and bye bye the programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics and they are personalized with one on one training individual evaluation and remedial sessions the reason chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real olympians from leading universities in india united states and europe some of our students come back to teach at chinta from oxford cambridge harvard mit ucla isi cmi iits tifr and iisc for more information visit chinta.com